Hello everyone and welcome to this video. My name is Dan and today we will be looking at the Zod release version 3.20. Uh, I have been a long time user of the Zod data validation library for JavaScript and TypeScript. I highly recommend it and we'll go and look at some of the exciting features in this release. Let's start off looking at the pipe method. Uh, this is going to be available on all schemas, and its intended purpose is to chain multiple schemas into a validation pipeline, and it's going to typically be used in conjunction with transform. Uh, there's an example here in the documentation, but let's go ahead and check that out in our own code. I went ahead and created a node project. Uh, the only dependencies we have are TypeScript and Zod. So I created a pipe.ts file, and the first thing I'm going to do is import Zod. Then I'm going to create a schema for a valid age. So this will be an integer uh, between zero and 120. Then we'll create another schema that is going to uh, use the pipe operator along with the previous valid age schema. So in this case, we're gonna have an age property that starts off as a string, but we're gonna transform it into an integer and then validate that integer with this valid age schema. I'm going to uh, create a TypeScript type based on our schema using Zod's infer method. And then we can use this type as normal in TypeScript. Notice that we can use the integer, the number here. So it's going to expect us to, you know, to validate against the uh, final schema here in this pipeline. And I'll note that it does not accept uh, 25 as a string for age. So this is definitely the latter part of the pipeline here. Let's create a little function to test our parsing. We'll create a plain object with the age property as a string. We'll use the schema parse method to parse this raw object into a parsed object, and then we'll log our result. Uh, and I need to make sure I actually call the function that I'm using. And then if we run our file, we'll see that it actually uh, transforms that into a valid age. Let's see what happens if I modify this to be outside of our valid age range. Okay, it looks like if we run this, uh, we do get the Zod errors. It, this kind of parse will throw an error if it is not valid. And we get the number too big, maximum 120. So to me, this kind of pipeline operator here where you are doing some sort of transform and reusing another schema that you might have already created might be useful when getting user data either from maybe uh, forms on a web page or through an API. So the data type that's coming in is not the one you're going to be using um, internally to your code, in which case you can compose uh, a schema from other parts you've already created and um, you'll be able to have this little pipeline operator going. So it could be useful in that situation. Now we're gonna look at the coerce. It looks like you can opt in to this coercion method. Um, you can say that you wanna coerce strings. So if it's something like a number or a Boolean value, it will automatically coerce it into the expected string similar to how JavaScript might operate. And it looks like it's saying all primitive types support coercion. Okay, to check out the coerce functionality, I went ahead and imported Zod, like usual. I just have an array here where we do some parsing. So we're gonna create a, a schema in line with the coerce option. So we're gonna coerce it to a Boolean value. Uh, and in this case, and then we're gonna parse it, right? So we're gonna start with a zero. So I would expect this to run to be false. I'm gonna expect this to be uh, true. We're gonna do some of the same thing for numbers. We're gonna take in a string and expect it to parse to a 42. Take in a string, expect it to parse to 1.45. Um, if we take in a number, we want it to be the string 42. If we take in a Boolean, we want it to be the uh, string false. And then we can coerce strings into JavaScript dates well. So if we run this, if we go ahead and run this, uh, you'll see that this does in fact give us the Boolean values for the first two, the numeric values for the second two, the string values for the third set, and we do get a date. And then if you malformat your date, for instance, if you are missing, you do get the error and we do get the invalid date. So it is parsing as we were expecting it to do. All right, this next method, catch, is something that's really interesting to me. Interesting to me. Um, basically, if there is a parsing error, right, if this is not a string, you will get the fallback value that you set in the catch statement. So this was possible previous to this, um, but it involved a little workaround. So let's go ahead and check this one out too. Okay, we will import Zod as usual. We'll create a schema 
Uh, the simple one with just a name and an age. We'll create a test function so we can run a little snippet of our code. Um, we'll have a raw input here, and this time we're going to have the name attribute be undefined and then the age uh, property be null. And then if we go ahead and parse this and log the parsed value, we should expect it to fail because we currently do not use the catch uh, method for any fallbacks. And we do, uh, we do go ahead and get the expected errors. So for name, uh, we can have a fallback value of the string unknown and for age we can have a fallback value of zero and then let's rerun our script and see what happens okay we do get the expected fallback values we get the the string unknown and the number zero okay something interesting it does look like the fallback value you get or you have to pass into catch has to match your uh, type of the rest of the schema. The other thing I want to see here is if we can apply a fallback to the entire object. So I, I suspect this will work where if uh, we are parsing something where there's like no data or the entire object is undefined, we want to have a fallback value to something specific. And in this case, what we would have to do is replace this with undefined, and then let's see what happens if we go ahead and run our code. We do, we get the fallback value. So if the entire thing is missing, we have the option to have fallback values at various levels, which is really exciting actually. Uh, I can find a use case for this in my current code. Next on the list, we have the uh, symbol method. I don't use symbols very often, but it looks like this was not something part of Zod's type system for quite a while. Um, but this is good news in case I run into a case where I need to use symbols. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and skip writing any code examples for this one. I think there's a decent example right here in the text. If I move on down, we have a built-in method now for refining a string type to a specific format, in this case, uh, the date time. Uh, this is nice because this is a pretty common thing where you want to validate or parse ISO date time strings. Um, previously, what we had to do or what I had done was use a different library and use a, a custom like validator or a, a dot, the dot refine method in Zod. Okay, some interesting things to note here is by default, uh, you can only use the UTC date time. So the ones that end in Z, uh, it will not work if you have an offset in your date time string, unless you specify the offset parameter. So if you do offset true, then it will allow you to parse a date time uh, with a offset. All right, in this one, uh, we're going to import Zod. I'm going to create an output array as before. I am interested in seeing if it parses the date time as expected, the ISO string. I'm interested if it will accept uh, just the date parameter. So let's go ahead and log, excuse me, and let's run this code, see what happens. All right, we do get an invalid date time. I expect it's this one here. So if we remove this and then rerun the code, ah, excuse me, I had to save the file. Okay, so yes, if we if we do this um, and we have a properly formatted date time, it does work. But you have to have the the whole time part of it as well. All right, so we know that first one works. So if we remove the Z, we are expecting this to not parse correctly. Yeah, it does look like that does not parse correctly. If we add a lowercase Z, let's see if that works. Okay, it's interesting. It does like the lowercase Z does does seem to throw the error. It does not parse correctly. All right, let's try it with the offset. And if we have this plus two over here, yep, that one works too. Okay, what looks like the last of these uh, listed features are the, the finite uh, way to restrict a number schema to finite values. So if we have a standard number here, it should parse correctly and otherwise uh, infinite and minus infinity values should not parse. So let's go ahead and test that out real quick. Right, so if I have 42 in here, it does parse correctly. And I suspect if I try and do the same thing, but now with infinity, we're gonna get an error. If I try and do the same thing with negative infinity, I will also, number must be finite. So I think that's about it. There are some other bullet points here under what's changed, uh, including the formic validator Zod to the readme ecosystem. Uh, we have some additional features regarding super refine. So all in all, this is a nice set of features. I think the ones, if I had to guess that I would use most might be for sure the validating or parsing the date time ISO strings. I also think I'm going to use catch. I don't think I'm going to use coerce as much and I may end up using the pipe operator or method 
more if I want to compose sort of those sort of uh, transformation pipelines. If you're still watching, thanks for sticking around. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like, you can follow me on social media or like and subscribe to this YouTube channel. I really like the Zod library. Um, I have used similar ones like Yup and Joy. And thus far, my preference has definitely been to continue using Zod. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.